So, okay, uh, welcome everybody. Welcome back, everybody. So, I'm happy to introduce Antoine Song from University of Berkeley. And uh, Antoine will speak about uh, minimal volume, but more than that, essential minimal volume. So, Antoine, please, you can start. Uh, thank you. So, thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be uh, speaking in Grenoble. So uh, the topic today is going to be, and for my four lectures actually, is going to be uh, the condition that the sectional curvature is bounded uh, from below and from above. And uh, I'm interested in that condition because it's a condition that's very well understood in some sense. And it's clear, um, it's um, closely related to um, topology. So you can really relate the geometry to the topology in a, a very nice way. And this is what I'm going to try to explain in these lectures. And also this condition, of course, is related to condition on the Ricci curvature. So at least historically, a lot of results, say for Ricci curvature or first proof for sectional curvature. So it is worth studying sectional curvature and see what you can prove that might give you some intuition or inspiration for other kinds of uh, curvatures and other generalizations. And also, so even though this uh, condition is relatively very well understood, there are still uh, quite a lot of open questions that, seems, that seem very elementary. And uh, curiously, people are not able to, to answer these questions. And I'm going to um, state some of these questions and conjectures. All right, so what's the goal of, uh, of my lectures? First, I want to introduce those invariants that are in the title. Uh, introduce mean vol, the central mean vol. And uh, uh, give you um, some intuition and uh, theorems about these quantities, these invariants. And secondly, I want to talk about collapsing theory. So you, I could have given as a title for my talks, uh, collapsing theory of Chigurhukaya-Gromov, but I'm going to uh, use Minvol and S Minvol as a pretext to present you this uh, collapsing theory. Which is due to Chigur, Fukaya, and Gromov. Um, let's see. So the plan for my week is going to be like this. Roughly speaking, each section is one day. The first section, which is today, I'm going to give some definitions and state some. Uh, results. Uh, in my second section, I'm going to start talking about collapsing theory because we will see in my first section that uh, when you want to, to study minimal volume and essential minimal volume, you really need to understand actually what's happening in the collapsed part or in the collapsing part. I'm going to explain what that means. So my second section is going to be the first things that you can say about uh, collapsing theory. And there's something, a basic structure that is called F structures that is due to Chigurh and Gromov. And I'm going to explain what these are. And using F structures, these so-called F structures, you will be able to have some collapsing constructions. So constructions of continuous families having some particular behavior. In my third section, I'm going to, to uh, continue on collapsing theory. And I'm going to this time talk about end structures. So end structures were due to uh, Chigur Fukaya and Gromov and end structures generalize F structures. And in some sense, end structures capture uh, 
entirely what's happening in the um, uh, thin part of manifold with bounded sectional curvature. So it's a, a very far reaching um, theory and I'm going to talk about that in my third section. And in the last section, I'm going to give a corresponding collapsing construction. So this time a collapsing construction that corresponds to this N structure. So please. And we'll see some applications. So that's the plan. All right, so I'm going to first to give you some quick definitions because minimum volume and essential minimum volume are easy to define now. Huh? Let's see. First, a notation. So in my talk, n is always going to be a closed manifold of uh, dimension n. Of dimension n. And we will denote by this curly M the set of metrics on M such that the sectional curvature of the metric is between minus one and one. And in some sense, all my lectures are going to be about uh, studying that space, right? So what is the minimum volume? The minimum volume of your manifold is just going to be the infimum of the volume over that space. Um, so. Over that space. And uh, so it's a geometric way to measure the complexity of your manifold. And it was introduced by uh, Gromov. All who had the idea in the 80s to kind of measure a topology by using geometry. Um, all right, so you can also define a variant, a cousin of this invariant, which I'm going to call the essential minimal volume. Um, but first, um, so let me give you a, another notation. So for all delta positive, you want to denote by M larger than delta, the delta thick part of M. So um, the delta thick part is just going to be all the um, points in M such that the injectivity radius is larger than delta. With respect to the metric G. Then you can define the essential minimum volume as follow. It's going to be the limit as delta goes to zero of uh, the infimum of a volume, this time the volume of the delta thick part. Again, for for metrics with uh, sectional curvature bounded by one, and as you can see here, so the the limit exists when delta goes to zero simply because this quantity is uh, monotonous when delta is varying in one direction, um, and um, so clearly. From the definition already, um, 
the essential meal volume is upper bounded by the minimum volume. Oh, let me write it down. And in fact, the difference can be arbitrarily large. Um, maybe I will have time to, to, to talk about this point later in the lectures. But first, um, oh, okay, this is one definition of the essential mean volume, but I want to write down the definition of the essential mean volume, which is closer to the definition of the standard minimal volume. So I want to rewrite the essential mean volume as an infinite of a volume. So let's do that. So writing it as an infimum of a volume is, at least for me, psychologically more, more satisfying. So how to do this? Recall that, um, so last week, I think you saw this theorem at least twice, which is that um, by trigger, if the sexual curvature is bounded by one and the injectivity radius is, um, is larger than, uh, say, a delta that is fixed, then you have uh, compactness uh, in the C1 alpha sense. So that means you take any sequence and uh, with these, um, these assumptions and a sequence of points, then uh, in the pointed sense, you have gromov hausdorff convergence and the limit is, is um, a smooth manifold. And actually you can upgrade this convergence to a C1 alpha convergence, meaning that the limit has a C1 alpha metric in particular. And uh, so I, I'm not going to, to say more about this result, but I want to use this to to, to see what you can say about the, the essential mean volume. So before giving you a second definition of the essential mean volume, let me uh, define a weak closure of uh, that space of bounded sexual curvature metrics. So in order to define a weak closure, you will need the notion of weak convergence. And the weak closure is just going to be all the weak limits in this sense of uh, weak convergence. So how do you define this weak convergence? We will say that the sequence converges weakly if mm, so if let's see, there exists for oh, if for any delta there exists an integer q that might be a zero, and there exists corresponding sequences um, so one, two, q, delta, such that, um, okay, I'm going to switch pages. So that first, the limit along the sequence of the distance between uh, K I L is infinity for any K and L 
that are not equal among these numbers. Secondly, you want the delta thick part Let's see, maybe just to be more precise. We want this pointed sequence to converge to a limit in the pointed chromop Hausdorff sense. Chromop Hausdorff sense to a limit for, uh, let's see. So the limit is a. Um, metric space for, for any k one of those um, integers. And for any sequence of points, ki inside the delta thick part of gi, the distance of PI to the set of those points, reference points, is going to be uh, bounded. So it's bounded as I goes to infinity. Oh, all right, so it's just a technical way, rigorous way to say the following. The, for any delta, the delta thick part of your manifolds is converging in the multi-pointed row of Hausdorff sets. And if that's the case, you just say that you are uh, weakly converging. So um, if that's the case, the weak limit of uh, the sequence of metrics is defined as uh, the union over D, uh, sorry, over uh, delta of the partial limits. Right, so um, for let's say any delta, this is well defined and for two deltas one bigger than the other one of them one of those limits is included in the other naturally so you can take the direct limit if you want in some uh, in, in other words you take the just the union as delta goes to um zero is there any question on that definition All right, so this is the natural definition of a weak limit, if you want, to, uh, 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 that enables you to um, not lose too much information. And so because of this weak limit, This notion of weak limit, you can define this the notion of weak closure of your set of metrics with bounded sectoral curvature. As the all the possible weak limits of metrics. in this set of uh, metrics with bounded sexual curvature. And of course, a metric, a smooth metric with bounded sexual curvature is going to be its own weak limit. So um, this closure contains your uh, original set. And now the claim is that the essential minimum volume of M is the infimum of the volume over this uh, larger set.
Right. So this is um, that that was our um, our um, what I, what we wanted to do, which is to rewrite the essential meaning of volume uh, as an infimum of the volume, and um, in order to essentialize the main volume, the idea is just to enlarge a little bit the the space of bounded section curvature using this notion of weak limit, say. Um, and moreover, so that's part of the claim. Um, because of... When there is a question on the chat for you. Yes. So, um, okay, so the, the question is about how to define this uh, weak limit. Mm, is it some kind of collimate to do that? Yes, so these spaces are nested. It's a sequence, it's a nested sequence of spaces. Uh, one is naturally embedded into the other. So when you take, um, uh, when you look at this limit, so delta is fixed, you take the limit that gives you a space that is uh, um, uh, Y delta. So when you take a smaller delta, the corresponding y smaller delta contains this y delta. So uh, this weak limit is the direct limit of these spaces. Uh, you take the union and you identify points in a natural way when they're uh, equal um, according to these embeddings. So let me know if it was not clear enough. So now I'm going to, um, to continue. Because of the theorem of Krieger, um, Okay, so no, it, it follows from the it follows from the fact that the uh, okay, so it, it does not exactly follows. Okay, um, uh, what should I say? Uh, so once you know that for any delta, this converges. So you have let's say you have a sequence of delta going to zero, such that this converges, then it follows that if you take a smaller delta, um, the limit corresponding to that delta contains the other limits in the natural way. Um, is it the question? So, Another question, is the union over K disjoint? Yes, yes, because, um, so in the definition, I'm making it carefully that, um, so I impose that you take sequences that are really uh, diverging from each other. So the limits are really corresponding to different regions of your manifolds. And so the union, here is going to be a disjoint union over K. And the integer Q delta depends on delta. Um, so, so yeah, right. Anyway, one thing about this is um, because of Chigger, so actually the central mean volume is realized by one of those weak limits. Mm, so, I'm sorry. So it is the volume of a manifold
in this uh, closure, weak closure. Um, and moreover, so automatically, uh, maybe I forgot to say that maybe automatically this is a complete. C1 alpha metric. And uh, M infinity is a smooth map. So in other words, you can think of essential mean volume simply as the natural variant of the minimal volume, which is actually realized by something, which is realized by uh, um, a Riemannian manifold in a certain closure of the space of bounded sexual curvature metrics. So that's it for the definitions. Let me move on to some results that uh, I, I'm going to give you some, what I think are the main results for the minimal volume. Some important results. Important results. Mm. So all these results that I chose are lower bound for the minimal volume or the essential minimal volume. Some of them are topological, some of them are more geometric. Mm. So let me say something. There are very few general, say, topological lower bounds. So obstructions for the minimal volume. or similarly for the central mean volume. There's a trivial bound, a quote unquote trivial bound. Which comes from uh, characteristic numbers. Um, any um, n and characteristic characteristic number p, you have the following. You have that the minimal volume of m is lower bounded by a constant depending on m and your character's number times the characteristic number of m. Uh, character's number, for example, the Euler characteristic. And why is that? Well, that's because uh, by uh, Chernbyl, you can write this as an integral of a polynomial in the curvature tensor. Curvature tensor. But if you assume that the curvature is bounded by minus one and one, then this is going to be less than the integral of one, right? Which is the volume, which is what you want. Antoine, there is another question in the chat. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes. Uh, the question is about the, those metrics that realize the essential mean volume. Exactly. So it can be non connected, and moreover, in general, you have infinitely many uh, connected components. All you know is that it's a C1 alpha metric and it's complete. But you might have, you, you, you start with M, which is connected and nice, but um, the metric that achieves the essential mean volume might have a lot of connected components. And it's a theorem that says that the number of components is finite, but it might be. Um, uh, non-connected. Non so the answer to your question is yes, it might be non-connected. If you take um, a surface of say genus two, you, um, you can look at the metrics realizing the central mean volume of a surface of genus two and you might obtain um, um, 
a number of pair of pants in the limit. So disconnected a union of pair of pants that are hyperbolic. So maybe uh, let me write. Connected components. Right. Okay, let's come back to uh, to, to some lower bounds for the minimal volume and the essential minimal volume. Again, you have this trivial bound by characters numbers for the minimal volume. So for the essential minimal volume, it's kind of a little bit less trivial actually, but you still have a bound, a lower bound by. Sorry. By the Euler characteristic. Euler characteristic. And it's less trivial because it, it really um, needs this theory of a uh, Chigur and Grumov. But at the end, by the end of, say, the second lecture, so the second day, I think. Um, we will understand why the central main volume is lower bounded by the other characteristic. But I put that in the category of trivial bound because they're, um, they're um, closely related. So that's one bound. And there's exactly one other general topological lower bound that's known for the minimum volume, which is given by the notion of simplicial volume due to Gromov. So for the second lower bound, we need the notion of simplicial volume. There is one more question on the chat, sorry. Um, uh, so, it's a polynomial. So, okay, any character's number, uh, I, I'm going to use sorry, as a definition of character's number for me, any um, topological invariant that can be written as uh, the integral of a polynomial in the curvature. Uh, so at least, uh, for example, you, you take the other characteristic, this, the signature in dimension uh, four, for example, these are examples of what I'm thinking as characteristic numbers. So. so for the second lower bound, again, let me come back to, to what I was saying. You need the notion of simplicial volume that's usually denoted by, by that. Let's see, um, how do we define the essential volume, the simplicial volume? The simplicial volume, contrary to the middle volume and the essential middle volume is a purely topological um, quantity. It's due to grow up. And it's a kind of topological minimum volume if you want. It's the infimum of the, of the following sums. Assert that you have the following. So you can find simplices sigma one, sigma L from the standard simplex.
such that the sum of those simplices with weights R i is a cycle that represents the fundamental class of M. All right, so this means the fundamental class. So it's, oh, okay. So let's assume that M is oriented. If it's not oriented, we take the double cover. So say, say, if it's not oriented, you just take the double cover, connect the double cover, you, um, you get a number. And if you divide by two, by definition, it's the simplicial volume of your non-orientable manifold. All right, so here, this is the standard simplex. Um, right. And one thing to pay attention to is that these numbers for i are really to be taking in a set of real numbers. Otherwise, you don't, if, if you take ri to be in z, say, you don't get uh, such a nice invariant. Mm. And in some sense, this simplicial volume measures the, the minimal amount of simplices that you need in order to uh, cover your manifold. Synthesis needed to cover to cover your manifold M. By cycle, I mean that um, the combinatorial boundary of this guy which is the sum, the weighted sum of the common boundaries is equal to zero. Uh, it's important that you're really using this combinatorial boundary. So let's see, is there a question? Mm, yeah, that's right. The simplicial volume of a sphere is, oh no, no, is equal to zero. No, it's not two, it's zero. So let me, uh, um, I, I, in the next example, I'm going to um, explain uh, compute the simplicial volumes of uh, surfaces. Because, oh, maybe the confusion comes from the fact, okay, I, I see. Um, here, the simplices are completely wild, right? They can, they're not immersed, they're not embedded, they cover itself, uh, themselves, uh, they're just continuously mapped. And, uh, and uh, moreover, these ri again are real numbers, right? And so that's why I'm going to, to explain why the simplicial volume of say a sphere is zero. Let's do that. Uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, of a strange definition the first time you see it. But let's uh, look at some easy properties of the essential mean volume. And after these properties and these examples, I'm going to state the theorem, the lower bound. Properties. The easy property is that if you have a non zero degree map, say degree D map from one manifold to the other, then you have. the following inequality, meaning that the simplicial volume of your, um, of, um, your domain manifold is at least D times the simplicial volume of the target. 
And in order to see that, you look at the definition. Indeed. If you have a sum of simplices that represents M1, represents M1, the fundamental class of M1 in its uh, nth homology, this sum of simplices is sent via the map Okay, I'm going to call this continuous map F, yeah, F to another sum of simplices, right? And because F is of degree D, automatically um, this sum of simplices is representing D times the fundamental uh, class of M2. What it means is that one over D of uh, this sum represents M2. And then that means that you have what you want because the simplicial volume of M2 is going to be smaller than one of D times. times the sum of the ri and you can take it as close as you want to the simplicial volume of m1 right m1 uh, so that's the uh, property that follows from the definition it's almost by design that you want a quantity that behaves like this and once you have that you can actually already compute the simplicial volume of any surface. Mm. So let's see. How do you do that? Um, as a consequence, if sigma gamma is mm, the, uh, let's see is surface of genus gamma. Then you have the following. The simplicial volume of sigma gamma is going to be zero if uh, the genus is zero or is equal to one. And it's equal to 4G minus 4, so which is equal to 2 times the Euler characteristic. If uh, the genus is larger than uh, 1. So why is that? For the sphere and the torus, that follows almost directly from the easy property and that answers the, the previous question. Um, because these manifolds have self maps of non zero degree. Apply the easy property, get that the simplicial volume is zero. It cannot be a, a positive number just because um, this positive number needs to be equal, uh, this number needs to be equal to a positive multiple of itself, right? And so that's fine for spheres and tori. What about higher genus?
Um, <clears throat> First, you check that the simplicial volume of a surface of the uh, genus gamma is always less than two times the other characteristic plus four. So why is that? You just need to find an explicit triangulation with that many triangles, right? This is the goal. And um, in order to do that, well, you just look at the fundamental domain of your surface of genus G. Let's see, let me try to, uh, okay. So, what I'm trying to represent here is a polygon that represents a fundamental domain of sigma G. And um, with the identification that, 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 that are given on the sides, right? Um, so here, for example, is genus two. What you do is you take the trivial triangulation that, that you can imagine for this surface from that um, polygon. And you can count the number of triangles here. It's exactly this number. I think. Um, then, okay, so that's, um, let's see. Um, right, but that's not optimal. However, you look at this now. You look at the degree D cover of your surface by a uh, hygiene surface. Then by the easy property again, You have that, um, you have this inequality, but we, um, we just saw one. that the simplicial volume of this uh, larger genus, this uh, covering space, is less than two times the order characteristic. There is, there is a question again. That's four. Mm. Uh, oh, um, yes, uh, thank you. And uh, yes, yes, yes. So the genus here is gamma. G is for the metric. Sorry for the typo. Mm. Let's see. Let me come back to this uh, covering surface. So the covering surface has simplicial volume at most two times the other characteristic plus four. This is what we saw in the first step. But because it's a decover of the original surface, so you can write this following equality. Now you can just send D to infinity and you get an optimal upper bound. So that's for the upper bound. And it remains to show that it is an optimal upper bound. So you want to show the lower bound that it's also a lower bound. Good. Next, 
So how should you do that? Well, mm, mm, what you want to show is this. And in order to show that, you can check the following. So uh, even cycle that represents your surface. Mm, you can look at the volume. You can first put the hyperbolic metric on uh, on the surface. So um, this is a geometric step that is uh, very useful in this proof. So once you put this hyperbolic metric on sigma um, on sigma gamma, you can talk about the volume of the simplex or uh, simplices. Okay. Uh, so it's it's in. So first. Uh, We can make these simplices straight. So at the beginning, a simplex sigma might be uh, quite messy, etc. But what I'm claiming is that once you have this hyperbolic metric and you have this, uh, say, a uh, given simplex, you can. Straighten it so that now you have very nice simplicities. Where this is a geodesic that is uh, homotopic to uh, the corresponding side. And uh, what you can say in then that two pi times the other characteristic of your surface is equal to the sum of the volumes because it covers, you know, it covers the surface with um, algebraic multiplicity one. But this, is less than pi. So you can check that in a hyperbolic surface, any simplex that is that has geodesic sides is going to have a absolutely, uh, sorry, absolute upper bound on the volume. So the volume of sigma i is always upper bounded by pi. Um, once you realize that, then these lines give you what you want, the lower bound for the simplicial volume, and you're done. Singular, singular, simplicial volume. Oh, um, um, let's see how. Uh, yeah, I am not sure of um, how to answer that question. One remark is that the straightening thing only works, I think, at least it works under some um, assumptions. For example, here you need uh, some negative curvature. Once you, you have negative curvature, this method of straightening a simplex is well defined. But in general, for a general metric on a general manifold, you don't have a well defined way to straighten. A simplex. But uh, yeah, it's a good remark. It's uh, at least in spirit, clearly it's uh, similar. You simplify the synthesis that you have in order to be able to do uh, computations. Um, so that's it for the simplicial volume of surfaces.
And uh, now that you have a good feeling of what the simplicial volume is, let's um, state the theorem of Kromov. Does this volume always turn out to be an integer? No. So um, the, the values of the simplicial volume can be uh, non integers, they can be uh, non rational. Uh, in dimension two, as you can see, it's always a nice integer. In dimension three, already it is not. Um, but um, in, in dimension three, the set of possible simplicial volumes of closed three manifolds coincide with, um, essentially coincide with the volumes of uh, hyperbolic three manifolds. And in any higher dimension, so in any dimension uh, at least four, the simplicial volumes of closed manifold is dense in the real line. Let's see. Okay, so finally, oops. the theorem of Komov, which again, uh, surprisingly, is the only general topological low ground for the minimal volume. A metric with bounded sectional curvature. Mm. Then the volume of the dot ethic part is lower bounded. Sorry. Is lower bounded by the simplicial volume. So the meaning of that result is that you have this geometric quantity, the volume, and it's lower bounded by this purely topological quantity, which is the simplicial volume. And uh, in particular, as a corollary, you get that both the minimal volume and the essential minimal volume are lower bounded by uh, the simplicial volume. Okay, first by definition, let's first bound and the second bound comes from this theorem. Mm. Let's see, I, I still have 30 minutes. I'm hesitating whether or not I should give an outline of this theorem. Um, I think. So maybe not, maybe, okay. So for those who are interested in outline, maybe you can ask me later, but maybe I will have no time today because uh, I want to, to move on. Mm. But so that's it for the topological lower bounds. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's not much, but they're not, I mean, there are not many results. Mm. Here's a geometric lower bound. It's an uh, important result. It is due to uh, this son courtois and gallo that says the following. Actually, the minimum volume, okay, it's a rough invariant because it is defined using the sectional curvature, but quite amazingly, you can compute it for um, hyperbolic manifolds. That's the concept. Of their theorem. Then the minimal volume, the minimal volume of X is well, the, the hyperbolic volume. meaning that, okay, you take any other metric on X with the bounded section of curvature by one, then uh, you, you will have actually at least as much volume as the hyperbolic one. And um, 
a remark here is that by the end of lectures, I hope to explain why this is also true, in fact, with the central middle point. So we'll see it also holds for the central minimal volume, meaning that the central minimal volume of the hyperbolic manifold is also the hyperbolic volume. In, in dimension two, S min vol equals min vol. Oh yeah, that's a good question. So in low dimension, S min vol and min vol, there's no difference. Uh, I should, I didn't compute the minimal volume of surfaces. Mm, I leave it as an exercise. I forgot to do this. Uh, and, and But um, let me write it as a remark. Dimension two, three. Volume is equal to the middle volume. So in low dimension, there's really no um, no distinction between the two. And in dimension two, it's just a direct computation. While in dimension three, already to prove this, you need some theory. It's it's not completely trivial that uh, this is true. Um, but uh, it comes from the fact that in dimension three, if you look at the thin part of a manifold with bounded sectional curvature, you can always collapse this thin part with a bound on the sectional curvature and volume going to zero. That is always possible. That is not always possible in higher dimensions. Okay, I'm continuing with my remarks. Um, the middle volume and the central mid volumes are quantities that are defined using the smooth structures. And in fact, they depend on the smooth structures. So uh, that was a result of Laurent Bessier and um, also later in dimension four by Kuchik. Minvol and also S min vol depends on the smooth structure. The smooth structure of M, meaning that in high dimensions you can find two homeomorphic closed manifold that that are smooth and non-diffeomorphic, and they have different minimal volumes. Right. And uh, next to kind of illustrate our ignorance about minimal volume and, and the essential minimal volume, let me give you two conjectures. The first one is a, an old one, which is due to uh, Gromov. And simply it says the following. There exists, they should exist a dimensional constant such that if the minimal volume is less than this constant, then it's actually vanishing. To zero. So you have something that is known about that. So this is known in dimension up to four. So in dimension two, it's uh, trivial. In dimension three, it's not difficult. In dimension four, it is difficult and it's due to uh, to wrong. We will also see that my Chibogromov, the gap conjecture is true for the central middle volume. Or S min vol. And here there's nothing to prove once you know 
um, the work of Chigar Grumov. It, it is a corollary of the work of Chigar Grumov that this gap conjecture is true for the essential mean volume. Whenever the essential mean volume is small enough, then actually uh, you're zero. So if, from this point of view and the, the previous results, you see that the essential mean volume is a kind of idealized version of, of the uh, mean of volume. It, it satisfies a lot of properties that you want to you want it to be satisfied by the mean of volume. But here's a, another conjecture that also is open for the essential mean volume, which is you want to find other topological lower bounds for the mean volume and the essential mean volume. It's a bit scandalous that there's only two available, right? Um, so let's try at least in dimension four. What you can propose is the four. You take any smooth closed up. For manifold, take any genus that is larger than one, then you hope, you would like to say that the middle volume of the connected sum of these two guys, so N and the product of the two sphere with the surface of genus gamma. This is larger than the constant times um, gamma, the genus of the surface. So you, you can try to uh, imagine similar conjectures in higher dimension, but let's just focus on dimension four since it's the, um, the first non-trivial uh, dimension. Um, so that would be nice that would give um, a third topological lower bound for the middle volume that is kind of general. All right, so let me conclude this first section and I want to move on to the second section. So, So in some sense, studying these kind of invariants, min vol, s min vol, that's really about studying possible closures, not only the one that I defined, but other kinds of closures of the set of metrics on the section and curvature. And in turn, that requires the understanding of the thin part and the thin part is going to be the object of my talks, the topic of my talks for the next uh, three days, basically. The thin part being the part where the injectivity radius is small. And that's going to be given by the chicken for kind of of the, let's see. Let's see. All right, so let me move on to the second part. which is about the first structures that you can find when you try to study collapsing theory. And it's called F structures. And I'm going to give you a corresponding collapsing construction. Um, all right. So when I say that GI, a sequence of uh, metric collapses, what I mean is simply that the sectional curvature is um, uniformly upper bounded. So independently of I and the injectivity radius goes to zero. Everywhere. Mm. Uh, note that I'm not requiring that the volume is going to zero. That's a different condition 
I'm just assuming geometric collapsing, which means that locally the volume is going to zero, but maybe the global volume is still big or whatever, we do not care. We just impose uh, these conditions on the injectivity radius. Um, also a remark, maybe you, you saw that last week, which is when the sectional curvature is bounded between minus one and one, small injectivity radius is equivalent to saying that the volume of the one ball is small. We have a quantitative version of, of that statement. Um, before giving you something about the general theory, I should give you some basic examples of collapsing. And these examples are going to be based on the following principle, which I'm going to call rescaling along Keeling fields. Let's see. You look at the metric, or any metric on M, and you're given a killing field. It generates by integration an R action, right? And the idea is to, um, to uh, rescale your metric in the direction that are tangential to the Keeling field. You want to make it smaller and smaller, and you want to check that the metrics that you're obtaining have bounded sectional curvature, and moreover, the injectivity radius is going to zero if M is close, so M is compact here. You decompose your metric into two parts, the tangential part. And the orthogonal part. And you define the collapsing family to be G delta, you rescale by delta, the tangential part. And I'm going to explain to you why, why this is a really a collapsing family of metrics. Mm, right, so let me write down the claim. Delta goes to zero, second curvature. is upper bounded by a constant that might depend on the original metric, but at least it's independent of delta. And the injectivity radius goes to zero everywhere. In other words, you have, you have collapsing. Mm. Mm. Yes, so let's let's prove that. Let's look at the point in M. And let's look at the R fiber that goes through P. That's um, the R fiber. And then locally, just near P, everything is going to be in a small, very small neighborhood of P, or is nice, you can find a transversal to the R fiber that I'm going to call omega. So that, what do I mean by transversal? It 
And so can I mention one submanifold that is embedded going through P and transversal to all the R fibers that it needs. To, to, to the R fibers. All right. And um, the proof is then going to be just the computation in charts. It's something that is simple, that, but you, one should do it once in, uh, in their lives. So um, let's do that. Mm. Let y be coordinates on, on gamma so that p is going to be the zero, zero, zero point, and let x be the r coordinates. That corresponds to the r action, in other words, to the uh, killing field. x equals zero, and you want x to be equal to zero on your transversal omega. Then what you can do is to extend the uh, y coordinates to the whole neighborhood. Right now we have the y coordinates on omega, and you extend it in a natural way to the whole neighborhood. simply by projecting on the transversal. Along the, along the, um, the fibers. In these coordinates, um, switch up to this, these coordinates. the um, X vector film is parallel to the R fiber. And um, you can look at um, the uh, Y derivative and you can decompose it into two vectors and the sum of two vectors, again, one which is tangential to k, and this is orthogonal to k at any point. So you, you the, the y direction might not be uh, perpendicular to the R fiber, so you decompose it into a perpendicular part and a parallel part. And now you have all the uh, notation required. You can write down your original metric as um, such a matrix in the coordinates, of course. I'm just going to write down what this matrix, uh, matrix is and the ML and the L. So this is something you can check. Um, right, so A is a one one matrix, B is a one oh, sorry, one. Uh, N minus one matrix and uh, and uh, C and D are square matrices. Anyway, in these coordinates, P delta is then going to be equal to basically you, you, you multiply everything by delta square 
except the orthogonal direction, right? Because we're only rescaling along the killing field. And then, then here it's not clear that um, this, this metric is not uh, still going to be non-degenerate in the limit, but we can just change coordinates to see that actually this uh, metric is a nice one converging to a smooth one. Change coordinates. So when you change coordinate, you rewrite what your, your metric is in this coordinate system, then you get something else. So you get, um, Um, and um, now in this new system of coordinates, you see that this metric is converging smoothly and nicely to A0, no, A0, 0, and D. I want to change page, so here. Zero zero D, and remember A B C D only depend on the Y coordinates. Y coordinates because K is is killing because we're moving everything by isometry because of the definition of the coordinates. And so that means that this convergence here is really a smooth one. So once you know that the metric in some coordinate is converging smoothly, then clearly the section of curvature is going to be bounded, right? And moreover, oh, let me write it down. And we lost the connection. Okay, it's back. Your micro microphone is uh, shut. Okay, you can see that, right? Yeah, there we go. Okay. There we go. So because the metric, when you, we just saw that the metric written in a new coordinate system is actually converging to something smoothly. So the sectional curvature along that family is bounded because uh, the curvature is just the second derivative of your metric somehow. And the injectivity radius is going to zero. You can check that because um, Compactness of the orbits. Remember, n is compact. N is compact. So that is the classical example of collapsing when you just rescale along killing fields. And this, you can check as if you want an exercise that this generalizes to when you have multiple killing fields and they commute. It's important that the killing fields commute. So I'll write this remark. This trick to case where you have 
many Killing fields, a finite number of Killing fields, which are commuting. In other words, you have an R to the power L action. Um, and it's a general case of a torus action. Um, I'm going to end today with um, an example that is going to be important for us. Um, that is an application of this trick. Look at the flat interval cross R2. So you're just looking at 0, 1 with the usual metric times the flat R2. So I'm going to denote this flat metric by H. And let B theta be the rotation of R2 with angle uh, theta. And I'm going to glue the two boundaries of your first manifold using this rotation. Okay. So there. So you glue one boundary to the other by using your rotation. So you identify each point with its image by this rotation of angle um, theta. From a smooth point of view, you don't get anything uh, weird. You just get an S1 cross, S2, uh, cross R2, right? So it's diffeomorphically, it's diffeomorphic to S1 cross R2. However, what's interesting here is that you have this metric, this flat metric, and the behavior of this flat metric is going to be interesting. Um, so apply the rescaling trick in that example to um, to okay. I'm going to denote it by that. I don't know if it's a good notation. Uh, what it just means is that the rotation naturally gives you um, a killing field. So you rotate, and in the same time you. you go up. So this is the rotation, this is going up. So that means you have the following killing fields, right? So at time one, when you integrate that killing field at time one, you rotate it by angle theta and also you get got up by one. Okay. So you have a, a few cases that I want to uh, explain. Okay, don't have time, so I'm just going to continue next time. But let me say first that if theta is zero, then as delta goes to zero and you rescale it, you get a GH limit, then rescale. You get a gromov hausdorff limit, which is the flat R2. And uh, next time I, I'm going to explain to you, well, finish this example and continue with F structures. And uh, the goal is to, to see that by Chigo and Gromov, this and generalization of this trick are essentially the only way to collapse uh, manifolds with bounded sexual curvature. So it's, it's really nice. Uh, for next time, I'm going to, to explain what the GH limits are when theta is uh, either rational or irrational. And you, you, you can maybe think about that a little bit. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Antoine. Uh, so there is still a question in the chat, and maybe no. there would be more questions. Uh, let's see. Thank you to see them. Okay, the fact that the collapsing metric is converging thanks to the 
is confusing since it seems that at the limit, the dimension of the space gets lower. Yes. So what we did is, in fact, we are looking at small neighborhoods of P where you can write down these coordinates. And this, this neighborhood is getting smaller and smaller as I goes to infinity. Um, but it doesn't matter because uh, what you're interested in is just the behavior of the metric uh, in a very small neighborhood. You just want to know the second derivative of this, uh, this thing. Um, so even though this neighborhood where you can write down these nice coordinates is getting smaller and smaller, you can imagine that it's part of a bigger manifold that, that for, for example, if you look at the universal cover, then there you, you can write down the same metric. And uh, here, the neighborhood, you can take it um, of the uniform size. Okay, are there more questions? <laughs> okay, so if, if, if this is not the case, uh, thank you very much, Antoine, and uh, we'll meet again tomorrow. And, and we, we stay in birthday, actually, for the next session. Merci beaucoup, Antoine, à demain. Merci. Oui, c'est l'enregistrement, c'est